Good morning. Good morning. Day two. Good morning. Good morning. We're here with uh, Michael Kakaji. Is that right? Did I say that right? right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really great. It's really great to have you here. I'm I'm really going to try not to to show my tech um, issues that I had this morning because I've been on for the last hour and a half trying to navigate uh, some of the the bad Wi-Fi in some of these communities and areas mm -hmm. that our guests are coming from. Um, but uh, before we introduce you to to Mike here, our guest, I'd like to just. Um, I would like to just share a message that I received this morning that I think is is uh, really important from the work the work that we're doing, and it's not even work. And I think I, I've said that before, um, but this morning uh, I was given the message that the grandfathers were coming, and uh, and I remember several years ago when I. Uh, was blessed with the opportunity and I heard the message that the grandmothers, it's time for the grandmothers to come above ground. And this was a, a part of my healing journey as an urban indigenous woman connecting with my culture, my spirit, the creator, and just knowing right now that we are in a really profound time of rising and moving forward. And so I'd like to acknowledge all the grandfathers that have been messaging our Grandmother's Voice website. I'm just so moved by the beauty of, of what our, um, our ancestors, the creator, our brothers and sisters, our aunties, uncles, grandmothers, grandfathers are, are sharing with us. This is a real uh, gift to be able to be a part of this. And so I, I wanted to thank uh, all of our grandfathers that will that have joined us. Dennis, that was yesterday. Uh, the men before, the men in front of us today, the men the rest of the week, and all of these messages that um, that the men have been messaging grandmother's voice saying, "We're here for whatever support the grandmothers need. We're here," and that is so beautiful. And so. Uh, Scano Jody Nigasso. My name is Jody Harbor. My great grandmother was uh, of the Cayuga Nation, the uh, Six Nations of the Grand River Territory, Haudenosaunee Confederacy, also known as Iroquois. Every time I say that, I, I just get this power and love and understanding that it's my purpose to bring my grandmother forward into every conversation I have and every experience I have with relationships. So uh and Goa for being here and and showing support for grandmother's voice and and how we are moving forward and healing together hello and good morning my name is sherry Sayville, and uh, my my ancestry comes from the treaty six territory out in saskatchewan and it's such an honor and a privilege to be in the room of uh of, of greatness really because had it not been for residential schools and colonizations, we too would have learned from our grandfathers and our grandmothers. And so this is such an awesome time. Like I, it warms my heart, maybe not awesome time, but it warms my heart to know that there's so many people coming forward, wanting to share their story and, and, and feeling that there's a, a safe place within what we've created here online. So I'm just so honored to be part of this uh, day two of our residential school, uh, Thrivers and survivors, survivors and thrivers, and uh, and we have this wonderful man in front of us, Michael, who's going to talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, possibly his experience, what he learned, and and how he survived and thrived through all those horrible situations that he may have encountered in his life. So we're so honored, Michael. Um, had we been together today, we would have been offering you uh, tobacco. Um, but just know that the offering is there and uh, that we are so humbled and um, to learn from you. And you are one of our grandfathers. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, would you like me to begin now with my my experience yes, uh, yeah, yeah we've got no we try yeah. to well, yeah we try to get away from uh, from calling these exchanges or presentations stories because when you call them stories they minimize 
the uh, the actual body and the intent. So what we speak about now is we call them our experiences. In our language, uh, we call it the uh, in, in uh and like everything else in our languages, they've lost a lot of that in translation. And uh, unfortunately, our language has to fit into the into the molds that the the colonizer has set up, primarily with his English language. And uh, I'm one of those older ones that that have problems with that. And it's something that uh, myself and some of my other brothers from the north are working on. Is the uh, is trying to get the concept and our philosophies and our belief systems and who we are translated properly back into uh, into uh, extrapolating the real the you know the real true meaning of what we say in our languages as opposed to what has been recorded in in uh, English and then you have to go back to the time when I was four and a half years old and they, they dragged me into one of those institutions, and the first thing they did was, was tell us that we couldn't speak our language. And, and uh, as a consequence, uh, the, the, this, this, uh, through this inquisition and the, the imposing of uh, English on us has caused a whole shift in who we are and who and many times the way we think. And unfortunately, in many, many instances, on the way we communicate and just like we're doing this morning in this foreign language that we speak called English. Uh, I've been trying to start doing my, my memoirs, my, 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 my history. And uh, again, I'm one of those, there's some survivors out there that I can go through and sit down and write and, and scribe it all out and have no problems. Whereas myself now, because of recall, uh, I've been having a very, very difficult time. So what I've done is I've engaged a friend of mine. Uh, she's got a doctor. She just completed her doctor to assist me in, in putting this together, as well as my daughter. And uh, this way here, uh, it, it's, it's a little easier for me to to uh, to, to deal with. Uh, I, I, I've dealt with, you know, the emotions and, and the experiences of the residential school, but uh, I, like over the years, I, I'm, I'll be 82 years old this year, and I, I still experience uh, these nightmares. I just had one about three, three weeks, a month ago, where I wake up at night screaming and crying as a result of the experiences I had in residential school. And I'm, there's many more of uh, my my brothers and sisters out there who, who go through the same experience from time to time, and I've spoken to many of them. And there's no real, real way of uh, dealing with them except letting them come through. And that's that's how severe when we look back at that what this residential school experience did to us individually, our families, and our communities and our nations. The the thing the other thing that that uh, well, it not doesn't bother me but it, it it's it's uh, it's an, an an issue that I that I wrestle with and that's where we are today and who's identifying or becomes the face of the residential school uh, uh, legacy and the experience in the Canadian uh, the Canadian mosaic thing or, or the presentation today. Um, and I, and I shared, uh, you know, you talk about you're from Treaty 6. Well, I have friends, so many friends out west and uh, Ed Cusaw, so from, from Kamsak, and uh, he's the Ghost First Nation. He and I were, were and, and uh, we were on that group that went across the country for the AFN, for the Assembly of First Nations, gathering information, from, uh, setting up the, uh, the final settlement agreement or supposedly doing that. Uh, and throughout that whole exercise, and it took us a couple of years to do that, uh, and I forget how many, you know, maybe 15 uh, contacts with survivors all across the country, at one given time, no one ever in one of any of our meetings stood up and, and suggested this whole aspect of truth and reconciliation. If you look back now at, at, at the dynamics associated with the residential school settlement agreement, the focal point now is 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 from Murray Sinclair as being the spokesperson 
for re residential school survivors and this whole aspect of truth and reconciliation, which is fine, okay, which is fine, uh, and I, I don't, I don't criticize that, or, or I, but I have issues with how the survivors have been shoved aside, and 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 in, in many cases, and too, and too sadly, becoming the 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 lost victims in this whole aspect of the residential school settlement agreement. What they fail to recognize or fail to even even communicate with is that this residential school settlement agreement was meant for the survivors and their families. And and from that, we were supposed to have these spinoffs. Eventually, once the uh, survivors and their families were, were, were compensated and, and were, were uh, had, had time for closure, then we could probably perhaps look at reconciliation. Reconciliation is, is, a, is a dismal failure. And I say this with all due respect for those that work, work under that the uh, reconciliation umbrella. The reason why it's a dismal failure is because that, the, that, the, that element that was supposedly the driving force behind the uh, truth and reconciliation has not been taken over by the government. If you look back at, at the dialogue and, and, and how it's, it's managed and how it's passed on, many, many people, uh, the average Canadians, if you ask them about truth and reconciliation, they all consider it to be a, a, a program of the federal government. And it's not. It's part of the, the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement that was given to, to those of us that went through to, to, to settle up for the wrongs and the injustices done to us and to our families and to our nations and to our communities. And, and if you look back at it, what's happening there now, it, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't resolve. We have an incident here in Ontario out of St. Anne's School up in, up in the James Bay Coast that they're involved in, in a court case. And, and I think, I forget the amount of money, I think, I think some close to $30 million that uh, Canada has spent uh, taking the, this, this students and the former uh, students of the St. Anne's School to court, and all they want is, is a release of their records from an investigation that the OPP did years ago on, on the harms and, and, and wrongs that were done to the students there. Yet Canada spends all this $25, $30 million fighting them in court, and, and they're still not done. They still got to go back to court. Uh, and and I don't hear nothing from that from from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Not a word. So you can't you can't. Uh, I have a saying, you know, you can't suck and blow at the same time. You either have to be one or one or the other. And when you have incidences like that, and and uh, you know the the what I say a lot of times is when they look back at truth and reconciliation and how it was supposed to be done, and I, and I challenged them at that time when I was with the AFN, saying that, like, you know, it's not going to be us all going out, in the, out into the front yard holding hands and singing from the yeah. There's, 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 there's a whole, whole you know, history of 150 years of abuse of colonization, of, of, of what happened to, uh, to, to uh, our languages, our culture, our, our way of government, the, the whole, whole reconstruction and re-engineering of our being as Indigenous people. And you, you just can't go back and say, okay, here, and this is what unfortunately happened. They come back, they throw, us, they throw some uh, money at us, which again was an insult. Tell us, uh, give us uh, uh, some compensation. Tell us to get over it, move on now, and then have this truth and reconciliation uh, dogma and and take over and and then forget about the survivors. You know, we suffered some some severe, severe wrongs. Uh, not only myself as having gone through the system, but my family, my grandfather. Uh, you know, with my stories, my grandfather. Uh, he went to war, and my great grandfather, pardon me, he went to war in, in the First World War, and when he was over there in in, in, in the Europe, he suffered. He was gassed. He suffered from mustard gas, burnt all his lungs, and when he came home, they told him that he may survive six months. Well, we used uh, our in, indigenous medicines, and we kept him alive for some seven years, 
and then he passed on. And when he passed on, his, his wife had passed away prior, he has three little girls in his family. Indian Affairs comes walking into the home and says, uh, tells the family that you, my great 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 grandfather, that you know we have to take those little girls because you can't look after them. So as a result of my grandfather going to war and fighting for this country, for this indigenous, for this colonial government, my mother and my aunt end up in residential school. My mother serves 12 and a half years in there, same time I was in residential school. He comes out, gets married. My father goes to war in the Second World War. Same thing happens in 1944. 1944 with my brother, my older brother, and my younger brother. The Indian Affairs walked in and said, look, because you can't provide properly for this family, we're taking your three sons and we're putting them in residential school. And, and that's what happened, and that's a history. And when you look at histories like this and stories, not stories, but experiences, and then these are the things where the where the Canadian military has to step up and say, "Look, we were wrong to do this because we, they weren't even citizens of this country. They didn't, they weren't didn't receive the benefits." And this is how we thank this one particular family for for going to war and fighting for their country. We, we incarcerated their children and their grandchildren, and that's happened all across the country. It's happened up in the, up, up in, the, up in uh, the James Bay area where, where my ancestors uh, came out of. So when you see all these different things that are happening, and then you wonder what's going on with this truth and reconciliation, I've heard nothing like that. And, and, and that, that's my experience, and I'm sure there's others out there that had similar uh, situations and experience like that. One of the things that I remember now when we started looking back at and it was, it was uh, my brothers and sisters down in the Marshall that, that worked with the, uh, with the children of Shamrock out of Sault Ste. Marie that were really the, the motivating factors in getting this, this settlement agreement high gear. And I remember meeting uh, uh, with, with our group in Sault Ste. Marie and the survivors talking to some of them, as well as some of the, uh, my sisters and brothers on the Marshall, and the concern that we had back then, this is going back now into the, the, the late 1990s and uh, mid-1990s, is saying that we didn't want this residential school legacy or experience taken over by the white coats and turned into some kind of study uh, uh, exercise and and then uh, having it all sanitized, packaged, and, and 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 delivered in that manner because it wasn't. It, this was one of the, probably the most destructive exercises ever, along with the, with the with the disease blankets and other uh, other and starvation. What they did to our people to, to gain access to the lands and to, and to basically destroy who we were and attempt to destroy who we were. Who we are, and and they were concerned over that, and, and a lot of those ones that I think about now are are passed on; they're no longer with us. But that was a sentiment that they left with us, and then it was kind of prophetic, and or the knowledge of them knowing basically what was going to happen, and we see that happening now. You know, uh, you come to the residential school experience, and everybody goes and talks to Murray Sinclair. Murray, Murray never spent a minute in residential school. You know, and, and uh, Ted Cusas was removed from the board of the uh, the uh, National Residential School Re uh, Research, Research Center at Man the University of Manitoba because he raised a question of almost happened with virus in its whole exercise. So, and again, okay, again, it's a suppression of history. And I, 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 along with some of my, my brothers and sisters in the Marshall and from the other schools, we're getting on in years now, the older ones. Uh, the ones that you look back that were in the institutions in the 1940s and the early 1950s and the 30s, and I don't think they left from the 30s, and maybe, but back then those institutions were hell holes. You no, know, uh, I remember attending the one in Chapel. There was no refrigeration. They used to feed us uh, sour uh, vegetables, and meat was rotten, and 
like the food was atrocious. I mean, they wouldn't feed it to an animal today. Or and if you did, you'd be charged by the health authorities. And those are the things that we survived. And a lot, a lot of the older boys that went there and the older girls that went there were just, were just uh, it was servitude. They, they were treated like servants and, and, and kept her for their, for their strength and do all the grunt work. So, so when you, you sit back and you look back at them and speaking to me, and I say that with all, again, due respect, because system, the system was changing, and, and I always call it probably a little more liberalization. When you look back at, uh, at the ones that speak now, some of that speak now, those forgotten horrors that happened to the old timers in those schools, guys like me and, and women of my age and all that, uh, was a big, big difference than what was one that went through in the 70s. You know, you went through in the 70s, it was like going to summer camp. When I went there, it was, a, it was absolute horror. Child labor. I remember, uh, you know, working the farm and and, and planting. In September, you spent the two weeks in September picking potatoes and harvesting and all that. It's all child labor, you know. Uh, so those are the things that when you look back at truth and reconciliation that nobody touches on. Yet those are the, those are some of the elements that have that have really really uh, played a part on on who we are as as Indigenous people today. The other, the other thing that um, I, I, I speak about, and, and I, had, I had problems with this, with my language, uh, retaining my language, and being able to speak my language. Uh, I basically had to relearn my language, uh, and through, it was kind of a, a blessing in disguise. When I was in Shaplo, there was, there was an amalgam of all different people from different tribal backgrounds. We, we had in Shawnee people there. At Hoda and the Joni people there, all the way up in the middle of nowhere, up in Chaplow. We had Crees, we had Blackfeet, we had Inuits. So there was a whole amalgam, a whole mix uh, of the United Nations as far as Indigenous people go there. When they closed the school in 1948, I was only eight years old. What they came back and they, what they were doing, and it was, I called it the division of, 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 the, of the tribes. They took all the, most of the, uh, the, Anishinaabe people, and they shipped them to Kingwalk, which is primarily in uh, in Anishinaabe territory. They took all the Haudenosaunee people, and we had Haudenosaunee from from Quebec and and, and all that whole right through their whole homelands there, and most of them were shipped back down to the Mush Hole. Me being Cree, and 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 uh, my my brothers and, and some of the other families, I was fortunate enough to be shipped up to Moose Factory. Now, when I got up to Moose Factory, there wasn't that many white people up there. There were some Hudson Bay people, uh, some missionary people, and some people that worked in the school. But primarily, the, the village on the island was all Cree. And as a consequence, the, the dominant language or the language of the day in exchange was Cree. So, so through providence of, of transfer, and, and I'm closing the shop of school, I went back up and, and I relearned my language. And, and it, it, it's uh, it stayed with me, and I was up there until I was 12 and a half, going on 13 years of age. Okay, so then they, they take me at that 13 year of age because I wasn't going into grade eight, and they had no high school in Moose Factory. They shipped me to see St. Marie and my brothers to attend school in Moose Factory, or pardon me, in, in Shingwalk and Sault St. Marie. When I get to Shingwalk and Sault St. Marie, uh, there's OG Cree people there and, and Mishnami people. The language similar and all that, but I, I didn't have the, the ability to, to converse in, in Cree. And as a consequence, I ended up uh, relearning uh, probably some OG Cree and some Anishinaabe. But the language stayed with me over those years, and it's just in the last uh, maybe 15, 20 years that I've engaged myself to relearn my, or re engage my, my Cree language, my uh, language from my ancestors. And it's been difficult. Uh, I, I, I've looked back now and, and, and you know, I, I see different things. And I tell people this and, and I said, you know, 
I remember uh, during the, the, the reconciliation and other events that we had with survivors and the, and the old survivors, the older people coming there and, and sharing in their language. And, and uh, if, like, again, because the, the inability of the English language to grasp the spiritual intent of our language and how we transmit to each other, it made it very, very sanitary and very dry and had to fit into the English language in order for them to, to, to record it. And, and that always bothered me. And, and I have a colleague of mine that I work with uh, from up north, my friend, a very good friend of mine, and uh, he spent some time in residence school like I did. And we we're, we're going to look back now at that at, at, uh, trying to find or or, or, or reintroduce or, or reevaluate or or explain the damage that was done to us with the removal of our language. The first thing they did with us was take our language away, and the reason why they took our language away is then because we could be indoctrinated in this foreign language and forget all our values and principles that we learn in our language. You know, um, my friend Andrew was, he was asked one time, and we, we speak, we speak back and forth, uh, like we'll, we call it Kringlish, we move back and forth in English and uh, uh, Cree, depending on who's there and, and who, who's engaged and who's part of the discussion. Person asked Andrew one time, they said, Well, Andrew, you spent 12 years, nine years, I forget what he spent. He said, How do you retain your language? How do you keep your language? And he said, You know, it was, I used to dream in my language. And, and you know, I, when Andrew said that, I, I thought, how profound that is, that a child being subjected to being forced to, for, to forsake his language would continue to go back into that. So that spiritual realm of dreams to retain his identity and who he was. And, and the, the more I talk now with, with other survivors in different gatherings, I, I find this to be factual. That was how many of them survived, you know? And those are all the untold stories of, of, of what, what our survivors and what our old people endured and, 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 and fought. You know, it's like the, the old man that brought his two grandsons to residential school here in, in years back in Sault Ste. Marine. And the, the person said, oh, you're sending your children to school. He said, no, he says, I'm sending my boys to war. And he knew full well what was going to happen. And the other, there's one other thing that when I look back at the Truth and Reconciliation and they did their final report, and I've raised this, I, I've talked to Ryan, Ryan uh, out in, uh, University of Manitoba at the National Truth and Reconciliation Center, or the National Center for Reconciliation, I guess they call it. And I said, you know, when you when you put your last, uh, your final report through as a document, I said, bigger the size of the Bible, I said, why didn't you give credit or provide credit? Because it's, 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 in some sense, it's, it's a scholastic historical document. You never give any credit to the trans to those who translated uh, from, from the survivors who who uh, shared their experiences in their in their original languages. He looked at me and he said, "You didn't give any credits to it." I said, "Well, no." And this begs me the question: like, who did all the the actual transcriptions, or was I, or and I or let's go further than that, right? I said, "What happened to those?" experiences that were done in our original languages where they just shoved aside because they had a bunch of scribes in a room just uh, that were non-indigenous uh, non and didn't want to take the time to understand the language. And I said, that if, if so, and I said, I don't know only you people that were on the inside would know that. That's so much a shame on you. Shame, shame, shame on you. Is because if you go back to the people like me and others who went through that same situation, the first thing they did was to destroy our language and destroy our, our, our identity through, through uh, diminishing and, and stripping us of our language. 
And that is that bothers me. Really, really bothers me. And and uh, unfortunately, probably a lot of those that shared in their in their original language are no longer with us. You know, so, so every now and then, I, I take the time to honor their spirits in that in that whole aspect. Of, and I say it in our language. You know, I, 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 sharing their language hoping that this, their, their, their experiences would be for future generations. But, but in those situations, apparently it's not. And when you look back at the final TRC report, it, it is a very, very sterile type of uh, scholastic academic type of document. Anyway, that's, that's where I am today. And I don't mean to offend no one. Uh, I, I don't mean to hurt anyone. But sometimes I, 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 I speak things that, uh, and talk of things sometimes that uh, we had a long discussion on my friends and that we're doing a called Dabwe. Dabwe. This is called the truth. And, and you know, uh, and, and we're, we're, we're in the process. I've got a, a colleague of mine from the university that's doing a similar, uh, similar approach. Andrew and I are doing, and he's looking at truth as it's been moved through through uh, through Europe, through the European Euro, uh, European, uh, the English and the language systems over there, Latin and all the other stuff, and how it's been changed and molded. But in in our language now, uh, when we say "dab," it, it's it's consistent. I, I I spoke with an elder one time. And you just remember old Dan Pine, he was a quick noted doctor, uh, elder here. And I asked him one time, I said, Grandpa, I said, what is truth? And he's not truth. He's speaking Ojibwe, uh, he was language to He didn't, he didn't uh, see anything for you know, a few moments. And he was making medicine. So he continued stirring the pot, and doing things that old people do. And, Turned around, he's done. He sat down. He says, "You know, my boy, he's out there. But the truth, is, truth is a long, long straight line. Where it started, he says, you don't know. You don't know. Only creator knows. He said, and it, where it's going to end, we don't know. But it doesn't change. It doesn't deviate. He said, and that's what our languages are molded on. That's what our languages are in line with." And I asked him, I said, well, where do we as, as Nishnawi, as human beings, where do we fit in this, this, this lineage of truth, this light of truth? He said, well, we, we, in our life, he says, as human beings, we float around, he said. He said, sometimes we come very close to the thing that line when we drop off, and then we go through it, he said. And he says, uh, well, our teaching is us to remain constant and close to that line. Because we can't change when we speak of what is considered the truth. So I said to him, I was a younger man then, and I said to him, I said, Paul, well, well, when do we really know? Probably. When will we know what is the truth? He looked at me and he's got this little sparkle in his eye and he says, probably about 15 seconds after we pass on to the other side. And, uh, you know, if I believe anything, or if I can carry my life on any other length of time that I'm fortunate the Creator wants to keep me down here with, with other human beings, is that I eventually give or have some indication on this whole aspect of Babylon. Because that's what they took from us. And that's what our old people would articulate to us, was, was, was our stories and, and, and the significance of, of truth in our lives. And, and it's a forgotten element that many of us do now. We, we buy in and we subscribe into, into all these systems that, that have these lawyers that argue about who's right, who's wrong, who was telling the truth, who wasn't telling the truth. And, you know, we can witness that with this happening across this country, across the way here. And lies and the non-truths and everything else take over. And we didn't live like that as Ashtabi people. 
we had no reason to lie. You know, our world wasn't wasn't uh, the most perfect. We did everything within our being and our languages were structured that way that we couldn't really tell a lie. And those are the things that that we, that have changed us. And you see even how we interact in our in our in our families and in our communities. You know, we're, we're busy hiring lawyers, and we're busy doing this, we're busy doing that, and we've forgotten those small, small basic elements of being human and, and, and trying to maintain the truth. That's my experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mike. Hi, Sherry. Hi there. I don't know if you needed a little bit of a, a little bit of a breather. I'm listening to you, and you know, my heart is is so with the residential school survivors, right? Um, you know, and and you and you said a good point. You know that that people are going through Justice Sinclair uh, and talking to him about the stories and the and and what people have gone through. Let alone not even talking to the residential school survivors who experience it. and uh, and how you felt, um, you know that how you felt that your stories are pushed aside, that the residential school survivors' stories are pushed aside, and it's true. Um, I also have to, you know, when you when you said that, you know, you, you don't want to um, disappoint or hurt anybody's feelings, but you're telling the truth, right? And the truth sometimes hurts and it stings. And I really just want to thank you so much for saying saying that because it is true. We need to have the stories from the survivors, the thrivers, the people who went there, how they went and how they dealt with it. You're still dealing with it on a regular basis um, for you to still have dreams and wake up and, and have those situations where, you know, other people that were on that commission and, and had gone and gathered those stories. Yes, certainly they listened to those stories, but they never experienced it and they never lived it. So, uh, you know, thank you so much um, for, for, for telling your truth. Um, we always, we're truth tellers anyhow. Indigenous people are truth tellers. And when we carry an eagle feather, we are, that's our responsibility to not only uphold the truth, but to also speak our truth and speak it from the heart. So you certainly spoke your truth from the heart. You know, there's a lot of things that, um, that, that we can certainly talk about with um, the independent assessment process and how flawed that was, um, how flawed the Canadian system is when you know when you have people that may be poor um, are trying are the government's trying to say that they they that they do not know how to look after their own children um, we were my mom is a residential school survivor so I certainly know that from her perspective but we were also scooped away from her when we were younger and never having to go never saying goodbye to my mom right we were scooped at school and never having to say goodbye to her. And then I never saw her for probably six years of my life and how hard she fought in order to get us all back. Um, we, thank goodness none of my siblings were never lost into the adoption system, but my mom was coerced into signing signing us, some of my siblings to the, to the government. So they became wards of the state, but she was also coerced into trying to give all of us up for adoption. And she also said there was something in her Maybe the ancestors that just were niggling in the back of her head saying, you know, Hilda, this is not always going to be like this. You will have the joy of your children. Um, you will have, you will get to know them. You will have an old life with them. And, and she did, you know, she had an old life with us. We all came together and there's 10 of us in our family. And so I really have to give, you know, um, so much love and admiration for you and for my mom and for all the survivors that never gave up and knew that there was gonna, that there is another, that there's something there waiting for them. Even though you have went through all these horrible things, but there's something else waiting. You're a truth teller, Michael. And, and it is just so honorable that we're sitting here in the same room as you as being the truth teller. And you know, it, it's not an easy thing. And we know that this is very, very important because this, re this whole week came from the survivors saying we need to have an opportunity to tell our stories. And this is how come is it so important for us to do the work that we're doing 
um, not only through the school board, but for everybody, all our listeners, because they may not be able to have an opportunity to learn from the residential school survivors. I was fortunate, fortunate enough in my capacity to attend three of the six uh, statement gatherings. And one was in Saskatoon just shortly after my mom had passed away. And uh, when I looked at those little kids that were lining up with the, with the residential school signs in front of them, you know, the MC had said, these kids are here because we were as old as them when we were taken away from residential school. But the difference was that their parents stood beside them when they were holding the sign during the, during the ceremony. And, you know, and, and being there for the, for all of them, I went there for my mom because my mom wouldn't have been, a, she just passed away. And so my mom wouldn't have been able to attend those. And so I know that she was with me and all the ancestors that were there during that time. And again, I just want to just thank you so much. And Jody, if you want to just pop in and, and uh, you know, just, I'm in awe. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, very moved. Uh, we had some some really nice messages and hopefully we can share them as we move along. But I wanted to just acknowledge, um, Mike, the organization that connected me to you and the group of, of elders that uh, Grandmother's Voice has been working with. And, and uh, um, we have Ida and uh, Melba here with us in the room. I'm going to bring them in the room. And we'll, what we're going to try is, is, are you there, Ida? Melba. Yeah. So what we're gonna oh perfect. Yes. Okay, good. So awesome. You're there? Okay. So we'll, we'll try, try to get for, in here as much as we can. Yes. Yeah, we're trying. We're trying to social distance and everything else here. So perfect. So what, I'm not what we'll sure. do is I'll, can you hear us okay? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So what we're, we'll do is we're going to mic ourselves and then please, we, we haven't really talked about the um, the Ontario In Indian Residential School Support yeah. Services that, that you all are organized with. So what I'd like to do is just leave yeah. you with mic on the screen and then if it gets too um, hard to understand, maybe you can we can hang up and have you call my phone so you can even just talk to the screen like we did that one time, okay? But um, you know, sure. if you don't mind, please please tell everyone this amazing work that you guys do. I just am so moved um, to have met you and we're honored to be standing side by side with you. Okay. Well, first off, thank you so much for inviting us to be part of your program. Um, I would like to share today uh, information on the settlement agreement, the hearings, and our group that we have at Six Nations. So, um, but first, I would like to I would like to share um, how I first came to be involved with this. Uh, when I was still working at social services in, uh, in the clinical unit, it seemed like through that summer, there was so much information that was coming across my desk, but also the people who were calling and the contacts that were being made. And I thought, you know, something's going on here because the more I read, the more I understood what a short period of time the survivors had to apply for the compensation under the settlement agreement. So I phoned Mike and told him I wanted to be involved and to help any way we could. And um, so I was very fortunate in early September, uh, I was hired as a health support worker with the Ontario Indian Residential School Support Services. And um, so I've been very fortunate in that. Um, great group of people. And, um, but I just wanted to, to share that because so many things come across our path. And I'm so glad that I didn't ignore what was there and what was coming because this has been an amazing journey for me. 
Um, my dad had been in the residential school and all my aunties, my uncles, my cousins had gone, but I was spared. And we don't know why certain, certain people were spared and others were taken. Um, but we all, I always asked dad to, cause dad could speak five of our languages here on the reserve, but he would never speak it in the home. And I always asked him to, to talk to me, to teach me. And he wouldn't. And I didn't realize until I was a course older that uh, he had been in residential school and he had been punished for speaking his language. And because he didn't want me to be punished, he thought that may be the same way that might happen, you know, at home. Um, but what a loss, what a loss that is with the languages. Um, so, I'll start in on the on the settlement agreement. Um, it, it was um, approved in 2006, and it was implemented in 2007. And under that agreement, anyone who had attended residential school were compensated only. $10,000 for being there and a piddly $3,000 for every year that they had been there. And so that was the common experience payment where anyone who had attended residential school could apply for that compensation. Um, and I just want to to read you this one thing because um, the government, the churches, and the lawyers all got together, and that would have been probably a couple years or more before it was approved because they realized that if every survivor went to court, for what they had suffered in the residential schools, they would have been compensated in the millions, millions of dollars for what they had suffered. And the government and churches realized that they would go bankrupt. So this is why the settlement agreement came about was to put a cap on the amount of money given to the survivors who attended these schools and suffered the abuses. So under the settlement agreement, as I say, there was the common experience, and then there was the independent assessment process. And that one there was the one where the survivors would be compensated for the abuses that they suffered. And those would be dealt with in hearings where they had to it was the onus was always on the residential school survivors to prove that they had been there they had to uh, remember and they were children at the time and they had to remember names places all of those things so the onus was always on the survivor to remember and share information on the abuse. Um, the the hearings and and um, but I wanted to to just say this here because um, in the settlement agreement there was a opt out period. And because it said, if you are a former student and you want a payment from the settlement and you never want to sue the government of Canada or the churches on your own, do not opt out. 
Instead, they can call now because that was the agreement that if you entered into this settlement agreement for the common experience and then the IAP, that you agreed you would never sue the government or the churches. And I only know of one man in our area that opted out of this agreement and he did go to court and he was able to be compensated but he also in that court proceedings he was able to comp that his children were compensated and that was something that our survivors had fought for before this agreement had had been ratified was for their children to be included in this agreement, but that never happened. Um, most of the survivors were not involved in um, the settlement agreement itself, like getting it together and preparing it. The only ones who were there was um, the Assembly of First Nations they were in and i think that was because of you know at that time it was phil fontaine who had finally come forward and shared his experiences of abuse at residential school but in their involvement in the settlement agreement it was agreed that any money left over after everybody had been compensated either through the common experience or the IAP, that the money left over would be would go to the Assembly of First Nations, which there should never have been money left over. <laughs> but um, so there were there were 150,000 children who had been removed and separated from their families and placed in these residential schools. And there were 139 residential schools across Canada, but there were 17 just here in Ontario. And that I think is a lot. Um, the Mush Hole, the Mohawk Institute here in Brantford was one of the first to open. And that was in uh, 1829, 1830, and it didn't close until 1970. So you can imagine how many generations and how many children attended just the Mosh Hall, the Mohawk Institute. I would like to talk a little bit about the hearings. Uh, they were set up in a difficult way for both the survivors and for the health support workers. We received a notice of hearing with the location, the place, the time, and just initials of the survivor that was going to be at the hearing. So we never got to meet with them before uh, like a week or so before the hearings or anything like that. We had to search them out once we got to the location. And sometimes we had maybe uh, five to 15 minutes to try to establish a relationship with the survivors. And most of them had no idea who we were, why we were there and what we were going to do. Their lawyers had never talked to them about it. Well, sometimes the survivors met their, their lawyer that morning. They hadn't met them before. They talked to them on the phone maybe once in a while, but they hadn't met them. So it was very difficult, but we, we tried to establish a relationship, explain the process, like why we were there, and then explain the process that was going to happen in the hearings. And also to help them 
reduce some of the anxiety that they were they were feeling then because most of them had no clue what was happening and what would happen in the hearing itself. So thank goodness for our own sense of humor because everyone we met, every survivor, no matter where it was, because we went to hearings from Windsor all the way through London, Brantford, Hamilton, Toronto, all the way up to Cornwall and Ottawa. And most of the people that we'd meet and try to establish a relationship with, because we'd have to ask them, do you want us to come into your hearing with you? Or do you want us to just wait outside when you have a break? So we had to establish a sense of trust. We had to establish, um, and again, um, reduce their anxieties. And it's very surprising because most of them did agree for us to be in the room with them, even though they did not know us. But we were able to reduce some of the anxiety with humor. And the Indian sense of humor is wonderful, just wonderful. Because we'd be laughing and reducing the anxiety, the nervousness and everything else. And, um, and we'd carry through. But in the hearings, uh, we weren't able to, to say a thing. The only one that could talk in the hearings was the adjudicator who asked the questions and the survivor. Canada's lawyer was in there. And the survivor's lawyer was in there. And they couldn't speak either. And we couldn't speak. So we only had that short period of time before we went into the hearing to speak to them. And then at break, we would have another chance to see how they're doing, if they needed anything. Was there anything that we could do or get for them? And it was really nice because a lot of times the families would come with them too. So it was really great because um, Melba's here too. And Melba and I attended hearings together. So a lot of times, maybe I would be dealing with the survivor and she would be dealing with family members or the other way around. Because the, the families also were very nervous. They were very apprehensive. They didn't know what was going on. So we were really lucky here that we had the two of us because it also helped after the hearings for debriefing. Um, I have to give Melba a lot of credit because a lot of times I would be screaming stuff in her after and she would be listening. <laughs> and um, because it, it's so frustrating. It was just so frustrating because we didn't have the time to prepare. Uh, the survivors didn't have the time to prepare. And um, and sometimes they were denied, which was horrible, horrible for everyone involved. So, but we did have a lot of hearings in Toronto, had a lot of hearings in Ottawa, and um, we met such wonderful people. And I give them so much credit because for some of them that attended those hearings, they had never told anyone, not their family, no one, what had happened to them at residential school. They hadn't shared any of their experiences. And this was the first time that they were doing it. So we gave, you know, you just have to give them so much credit for their strength, for their courage and for their resiliency. I, there's so many other things that we could talk about about the hearings, 
But I'm going to go on now to our group. Um, I was hired in um, in uh, fall of 2011, and the common experience was then almost finished for applications. So right away we started with information sessions for the community. Um, and during that time too, um, because Melba and I had worked with another um, residential group here on the reserve called the Lost Generations, we knew some of the survivors. So we started contacting the survivors and asking if they would like to start a group and so that we could get together. So our first group meeting happened in January of 2012. And at that time, we only had um, two survivors come and one lady who was a historian here uh, Leona Moses came. Uh, she had been, all been in touch with um, uh, Wendy Fletcher, who has a lot of information and a lot of records that were supposed to be destroyed with regards to the, it, the residential school, but she didn't destroy them. So she was... She had been a minister, but she was fired and she was let go because of what she had done was to retain those records. So our group started and we offered various events in the community, information for all community members, survivors, their families on the settlement agreement itself, on the IAP hearings, on the healing fund, on the commemoration, and the TRC. We, we tried to give as much information as we could. Um, some of our events were just wonderful. Um, the one that stands out there's two really that stand out for us. And the one was with um, uh, Billy Rogers, who's a motivational speaker from Oklahoma. And we brought him in because it was a family event. And for the youth also. And he came and there was standing room only in our community hall. And it was just wonderful because they interacted with each other. There was laughter, there was fun, and they gained so much information. So that was only one of the events. We've had so many. We tried to have an event every year. And um, the other one that was wonderful was uh, we had gone to every school on our reserve to ask if the teachers in grades six to eight would have their students do artwork that would depict what they thought about residential school. And um, of all the schools that we have on our reserve, only one responded, and that was O.M. Smith School. Um, we did up, I did up a, um, a booklet. I don't know if you can see that. Um, and it has, it's a tribute to O.M. Smith School inside. Oliver Smith himself, that's Oliver Smith School. Oliver Smith himself did attend the Mohawk Institute and he was principal of that school. 
So this book is a tribute to Oliver Smith School. And there's a picture of him in there. And what we did was we took the artwork of the children and we had families come in as many members of their families that could come in for photos because the residential school had broken our families, taken the children away from the families. So we wanted to honor all of the families and there were questions that we asked of each one, but um, this book is also one of the ones that we use to fundraise for for our trips because we have taken the group on trips and we never wanted them to be, always wanted to have enough money if was need be. Um, and we also, we also sell the, the t-shirts that was made up and um, I'm not sure if you can see that mm -hmm. but on the back is a picture of the mush hole itself so our group named the group we are still here and our one group member who speaks mohawk said how you say that is sagal Gantio Yaquis. So that's on the front also in the Mohawk language. So we always have those two to raise money. Um, we've taken we've taken the group to various events. Um, and we first started out, I think, going to uh Xingmok with them for their reunions. And our group just they they really, really enjoyed it and they knew they learned a lot of also while they were there. Got to meet a lot of people. Sometimes they renewed friendships while they were there. And we also went to other events in Toronto. The Council Fire has started uh the uh, residential school legacy celebration. So we've taken the group down there and we've stayed for the the three days that that, that goes on. Um, we've taken them to London. Oh. oh, we also went to Winnipeg. A few of them went to Winnipeg with us out to the Truth and Reconciliation Center where all of the records are housed at the University of Winnipeg. And that was a great trip for them too. The other one was that we raised, we had I set we all set up at the plaza in Oshwegan to sell our shirts, our books, and we also had other prizes um, to raise money because a group from Switzerland had been in touch with one of our survivors, Robbie Hill, and they wanted to do a documentary. And so they did the documentary, they, they were working on that documentary and we were invited to Switzerland. The residential school survivors uh, were invited to speak at the University of Zurich. So we raised money. Four of the survivors went, and I went with them, and we had a wonderful trip. And it was a trip of a lifetime for them, also for me, too. And, um, but our group has been nine years and, um, I give them so much credit because they have come from place, you know, a place where they didn't talk about their experiences to where they now 
go and do presentations. They've been involved with the speaker series at the Woodland Cultural Center. They have gone to Jewish uh, synagogues. Um, they've gone to schools, universities, school boards. And I just give them so much credit. And I've been so fortunate because they're such a wonderful group of people. Okay, thank you. You want to say anything now? Yes, Melba. I think so. <laughs> Who is next? Hello. <laughs> Hello, Melba. <laughs> okay. There you go. Go ahead, Melba. Oh, okay. Uh, it's Melba Thomas. I'm a lifelong member of Six Nations and uh, have been busy with the community for uh, 50 years. Uh, you can see by my information that I sent in, which was separated, of course, and um, I've been busy. I'm going to talk just, just briefly about the dynamics and of healing and how the group evolved and the benefits that uh, the group has had over the years. The Residential School Survivors Group at Six Nations formed in 2012 by survivors and Ida and I, the Resolution Health Support Workers, and we are employed, as was said, by ORS. We're very thankful and grateful that we could be part of the healing of our survivors. All survivors tend at the Mohawk Institute, located in Brantford, which is Six Nations land. The school is the oldest residential school in Canada, which began genocidal practices from 1828 to 1970. This school became known, and Mike has mentioned, and I think I'd have too, uh, known as the mush hole, as a result of the mush served on a daily basis to the children, and at times, contained worms, bugs, and other unspeakable things in the, in the cereal. The group began their meetings by choosing their name. And Ida has mentioned, we are still here. The group formalized and chose a president, secretary, and treasurer. The group met on a weekly and monthly basis to plan, discuss all relevant activities, speakers, conferences, fundraising, and to tell their story. So as a result of that, they learned to discuss, plan, and organize, and make decisions. And as we know, when they were in the residential center, they, they weren't allowed to make decisions. They were treated like the military. You're going to line up here. They weren't known as their name. They were known as a number. The group shared their experience. Experiences, as Mike had said, let's call it experiences. They are stories, but they're really experiences of the truth with each other. They learned that to be comfortable with each other. Their experiences at residential school and how the experiences um, and school officials and students affected their lives. They told their stories. They learned to tell their stories. As Ida had mentioned, they, they talk very little. Even their own children, and we've we seen that, we experienced that, where their own daughters started to cry. They never heard their father tell about some of those stories. The group identified in a safe space. It was considered a safe space for them with each other and um, related common, common and abusive experiences such as strappings, stealing food from the local dump, disciplined uh, for being on the grounds of the apple orchards. Many of these people talked about being hungry. They never ever were satisfied, rarely. So they learned to, again, share the truth. The group progressed to assisting with group tours at the Mosh Hole, as Ida has mentioned, 
uh, for teachers and school children and other visitors. They articulated their story in various rooms of the school beyond their safe space of the grounds. So they, they started to improve their speaking skills as a result of, of uh, attending various functions, learning. At various times, members of the group told their stories at the TRC events, which was mentioned, supported by each other and the uh, health support workers. They had the option of video or audio. Here they gained their strength to speak of their pain, shame, blame, which added, and they added to their stories. We know a lot of times people who have been abused, they don't tell their full story. It'll come out in different segments. It depends how comfortable they are and how, how, how much strength they, time, they have. Each time more information was released by the survivors. Several group members took part with Sam Thomas project. If you've read about that or, or knew about that, it was a project of reconciliation. Uh, Sam, his project uh, was around decorating doors from residential centers. He actually got the actual doors. And what he did is uh, he beaded strawberries. This was an interactive workshop consisting of about four sessions. And what they did is learn new skills because many of, in fact, I took part, uh, didn't know beadwork. All around me is beadwork. And, and in fact, my sister was a great beater here at Six Nations and educating non-natives on residential schools and the atrocities that were experienced. The settlers came from surrounding areas of Guelph, Kitchener, Cayuga, in other areas along the Grand River. So they learned new skills and became more skillful in speaking their story. Many, many trips were taken, as was mentioned by survivors, to Sault Ste. Marie, for example. Uh, they loved that trip. They looked forward to it every year. Uh, it was an annual conference and somehow it no longer exists. Here the survivors uh, researched their background in other family members who attended residential school. They couldn't wait to get there sometime and say, well, I'm going to go into the archives and I'm going to re research this. Or I'm gonna somebody asked me to look and see, you know, if my sister's picture was there. So they had a, they had a, a certainly a great time researching. So they learned some of those skills also. They uh, experienced research skills and identified the speakers relevant to themselves. They also met new people and made new friends. The residential center, Marshall, now has their own gathering on, on shirt day or on about that time. And we certainly have to recognize the uh, ORS organization. Mike has uh, made sure that, that uh, the generosity continued to assist with that particular day and it's getting bigger and bigger. Uh, we were a bit disappointed, uh, Ida and I, that uh, survivors weren't actually involved in the planning. So now it, it is well known that the, the chairperson of, of uh, the Mush Hole, the residential school, uh, is, is quite aware that uh, our survivors need to be involved. Each Christmas, the survivors celebrated Christmas with a dinner gifts, laughter, enjoyment of each other's company. And as we know, many survivors never receive gifts at Christmas while in residential school. Intergenerational members continue to suffer. And I'm gonna talk specifically about Six Nations. In intergenerational cycles that have um, been in place for some time, addiction, violence, death, and related to survivors and, uh, and their families. Many lucrative members, young and middle-aged, using money in the wrong way. We have multi-millionaires on Six Nations. And they're close. 
uh, with the understanding that many group members are contributing productive are the present ones like um we're talking Charlene, who I see. Charlene is a social worker. My sister Robbie, who you mentioned, she's a registered retired nurse. My sister Dawn, who's a, a survivor, uh, was a school teacher for 35 years. So we have many survivors who have been successful and very productive uh, community citizens and um, have been very valuable to our community. And as we speak, although they've been successful, many of them didn't speak the truth. It was a shame. They were looked down upon, not only by uh, outside non-native people, but a lot of inside too. They did not go to um, residential school and stayed in their home. So we have a lot of those. We have a carpenter, Puggy, Roland Martin. He's a He's a retired carpenter who has lived uh, in the community and has did a great job with his own children. Um, so we have some successful people in our community. We are very unfortunate in losing three survivors during this nine year period. Two of them I had picked up on a daily, weekly basis when the meetings were happening. So we miss them very much. And we certainly honor them. And I again, thanks to Ontario Indian Residential School Support Services in providing many needs of survivors over the years transportation, accommodation, food, sponsor support to the annual gathering of the Mushroom. And also thank to the Six Nations Band Council for also providing funding for survivors' activities over the years. COVID will eventually allow us to come together again. Thank you for listening and understanding some of the dynamics of, of uh, the groups that we have here at Six Nations. Thank you. Thank you, Melba. Thank you for everything. Thank you for your support. Thank you for just everything. This is, uh, I think it's a, a bit more than I thought it was going to be today from an emotional place um, as well. I think I can speak for some of our, our guests that have left some messages, but um, thank you so much, Mike. I, I, I don't know if you wanted to add something or if you wanted to stay on to speak with our next guests, uh, but I, before I introduce Charlene, I'm sorry, I look at you and I laugh at this morning and, and how long it took us to try to get her and Judy on. So I have to call Judy right now. Uh, I spent an hour, so everyone knows an hour, trying to organize to get these two on. And they have an amazing story that we're just gonna shift from this place of, of uh, I, I felt seriousness, but I, you know, but all of you have mentioned the lighthearted humor, love, that these people exude, and I just have to to express that it's it really is what it is. They, we have an amazing culture that honors humor as medicine, and so I'd like to invite Charlene to uh, speak a little bit. I'm going to give Judy a call, and I know she's watching right now. Please turn your computer off right now, Judy, so we don't get all that feedback that happened. And uh, Mike, I don't know if if you're going to join and stay on for a little bit, please. If not, if you're going to step off, please uh, share some words before you go. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I just like to, to, to like, hi, Charlene, how are you? Good to see you. I, I, uh, the, our organization was all run by survivors, four survivors, and our board's all set up with either children of survivors, intergenerational or survivors. And, and it's family based, and that's the thing we didn't have. And, you know, there was never, never a predisposition or a pre plan, a big plan on how we're going to do this. And how it all went together was just because of the people involved. And, and, and we, we grew into one great, big, big loving family. And, and uh, the things we accomplished, like if we, if we sat back to organize and become very formal, I don't think we would have done as well.
and and like like we we uh, we and we even you know like being being indigenous and being quote Indian we, we you know we're good with nicknames and serenios and all this and we affectionately called Melba and Ida Selma and Louise that was that was there <laughs> <laughs> that was the moment where we give the because they travel all over and and. Uh, you know, and the people that we had were just such wonderful, wonderful, loving, caring people. And that's what the survivors needed. The survivors needed love, you know, and and and, and unwittingly, and without really moving in that direction, that's what our, our staff provided to us. And that, that contributed to why we were such a success. You know, there was there was nothing pretentious about us. We... we we were family, and that's the love that we gave. And you know, uh, I'm just so very, very proud to have been being involved in this organization, and and the people I've worked with, uh, the, the brothers and sisters of mine, just absolutely beautiful, beautiful people. And it proves that who we are as Indigenous people is it's it's innate, it's in, in us to be that who we are, and it came up. I love you all. Miigwech. Mm -hmm. I've got to leave because my dog's outside and he's having a fit out there. It's yeah. minus 25 up here. So but I love you so much. Thank you so much for having me here. We'll see you, Mike. Yeah, we'll see you. Yeah, bye-bye. Yeah. Nice seeing see you, Charlene. Yeah. Take care. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, you too. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm glad to see you, Melba. Yeah, you too. You too. COVID has sure yeah. really separated us, haven't it? Oh, I know. Hi, Ida. Yeah. It really I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just giving uh giving Judy a call. So Ida, Melba, thank you so much for joining us today. Ida, we'll be in touch, and I think that we're gonna try to get you back on. Uh, on Friday or something, okay, through the rest of the week. Jody, yep. can I just show um, uh, Ida and Melba when you were talking about when you went to the um, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation and you were looking for possibly pictures of your family or your brothers or sisters. Um, I went to the one in Saskatoon where my mom. Uh, where my mom was living, and I went through the archives of the um, of the Anglican Church. My mom went to Birtle Residential School in Manitoba, and uh, and it's one of those things. Even though that she told us that she went to residential school, I looked through those photo albums ferociously, looking for some sort of evidence that my mom was in a school, and I came across this picture, um, and this is my mom and her. Two of her sisters and uh, and some of her cousins that were taken from the residential school. And when I saw this picture, and I'll show it to you when we do see each other face to face. But when I did see the picture, I I just cried. I cried for her loss. I cried for the things that maybe she experienced. And I was so grateful that we had the the the, the caretakers that were at every single event um that knew that when people were crying had offered tissue and had stood there with your hand their hand on our shoulder and then gave it given us a paper bag and said please do not throw your tears away that your tears are honorable and that we will burn the tears in a sacred fire and so i know how important all those teachings and all those caring that came from the residential school survivors just like you ladies are caring for your community and our community and telling the truth. And so I just want to say just a great big heartfelt thank you for all the wonderful work that you ladies are doing in uh, Six Nations. And, and please keep up the good work. We are so pleased and blessed to have our, have our paths cross with you. And we will continue doing the work with you and making the light a little, a little, little easier. Thank you. Did we did we lose Charlene? I don't know if you want if you wanted to 
Good. So <laughs> okay, these two ladies, Ida and Melba, I got to be straight up. I don't know how you guys hang out with these two. <laughs> I can't keep up. They're amazing. I have, uh, so I have, I have uh, Judy here on the phone because this is the only way we can do this right now. Judy, can you hear us? <laughs> I love it. Can you hear? Can you guys hear her okay over there? Charlene? I can. I can. Yeah. Hi, Charlene. Hi, Ida. And, Mel <laughs> and Melba's there too. So Melba and and we're gonna put you guys in the back room, okay, for a little bit and let um Charlene have a conversation with her friend here. <laughs> Go ahead, Charlene. Ida, she's from yeah, she's um Ida and oh Melba, there uh it's Judy. She's uh Judy Cooper from uh, West Winnipeg, Quebec. So we're on we're on to we're on together. <laughs> Judy, yeah, she was at, yeah, she was at one of the um, the one Geronimo had when the, when the two buses came down from Quebec. Isn't that great? She yeah. Mhm. Mm okay. Yeah, so I connected with her because I think that she should, even though she's from Quebec, because she she was there at the Mohawk too. So, yeah. So well, tell us, ladies, tell us about your, it's you, I was talking, I'm talking, but I'm going to step out. You and, you and Judy, tell us your story. Because when we started to talk, Charlene, you, you brought Judy up and, and you started to tell me your story. And I right away was like, please can just wait and save this, save this for everyone because yeah. it really yeah. is beautiful. So I have, um, so Judy's here. So you ladies are just going to have to take your turn because sometimes that the background noise might get in the way. But Judy, thank you so much for joining us. We had a little bit of a, a technical issue this morning trying to get you in here, but you're here. And I, oh, I, I'm excited for you guys to share your story. Okay, I'll let Charlie okay, talk. Thank you. thank you, Jody. Well, I'm glad you made it. Judy, <laughs> even though the yeah. real FaceTime and everything. <laughs> That's us, all right. That's us. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I'll just I'll just share um a little bit about me and um uh then how how we met and how I went to the residential school in 1966. So. I gotta start reading in my my language about myself about um because this is what I learned now. So uh Scano, Swago, Ewehehanwi, Nigaso, Otayoni, Nawaka Shout that, Iokono Nia Quenza that. Um I just shared with you Scano Swago is um hello everyone. Um Ewehehanwi is that's my name, is me. She's carrying flowers, and uh, my clan is wolf. And my nation is Kiyuga, and I'm from the Six Nations here. And um, yeah, I'm a mother of three, grandmother of thirteen, and one great grandson. So um, yeah, I just, I just, Judy and I have been in touch just lately, like for about maybe for the last um, fifteen years, Judy. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, I know who's counting. It's just like yesterday when we were there, right? Yeah. <laughs> and we were um <laughs> we um so it was um nineteen September nineteen sixty six. Um at first I was in um, foster care on the res here, Six Nations, and then um my sister and I were together. I had three brothers at another foster foster home on the reserve and then my mom was in the hospital um because she had to stay off her feet or she would lose my sister baby sister my baby sister was born in january 1966 and um so when we came home and she got my mom got home we lived in a log house um when my mom got come home my sister and i come home from where we were and um out of the three brothers, only two brothers came home. So 
my youngest brother, he became crown warden. So, and um, so that was our first separation from family. And so September 1966, uh, there was the four of us. There was me, I was 10. My brother was um, nine. And the other brother, I think, was seven, and my sister was five. So there was four of us um, got taken in by the Children's Aid. The Children's Aid took us to the residential school in Bradford, the Mohawk Institute. And uh, so we stayed there for the 10 months. Although we came home on weekends because I'm only 20 minutes away, you know, 20 minutes away from that residential school. And like even today where my house is now, I'm still 20 minutes away. And um, but we came home on weekends. We came home for Christmas and March break and Easter and that. But um, I just don't remember my times too because I was so confused when I went there. You know, like a great big building, and then we were separated there because my two brothers went on one side, my sister and I went on the other side, and she was five and I was ten. And she turned six in October, and I turned 11 in December. So, and, um, but yeah, um, when I was there, um, two of my aunts, my, my um, two aunts and an uncle came in. Uh, you're going to hear from two of them and my other uncle. But um, <clears throat> yeah, we was there, and just separation, just, you know, separation and Walking in lines, having numbers, you know, that was a, that was a big thing. And then having to do chores and get up so early in the morning. It, it's like life just changed. It just so changed into a singular person, not a family, you know. I was single, like it's like single and alone there. And um, even though I had a sister there, a baby sister, but, you know, I still felt alone. So I got along. There was um, Crees there from Quebec, plus one of Quebec. There was um, eventually the Ojibwe's came down. There was some from Six Nations, um, Sarnia. They were from all over, all over the res down here. And um, yeah, so I met a lot of people. Some Mohawks from Aquasesne, St. Regis were here, were there too. So yeah, and then I, I, um, I'm 65 now. I just turned 65 in December. And um, Judy, I think you're just a little bit younger than me, right? <laughs> or maybe lots, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to share just like like an intro. Um, oh yeah, my name is Shirley, Shirley Bomber, my GST name. And, um, but I just wanted to share a little bit because and when I heard Ida and I'm talking, and, and that's so true, when we, you know, she, they took us all over the place and everything. And, and that's how I got to, um, that's how I got to uh, understand a lot of things about people and everything like that, that were in a residential school, that we were all connected and our feelings were all the same. So, but um, I just, um, so it's just 20 years ago, I took off this code of shame and guilt that I carried. I blamed myself for that being in there. I was ashamed for being in there, taken away from my family and, you know, like my mom. And so it was just like shameful guilt I carried. And I, and I carried that coat for a long time till you know, till 20 years ago when I started, got, when I got into um, counseling and started my healing journey. Yeah. So I'm going to stop there for now, and I'm going to let Judy share her piece. Okay, Judy? Okay, yeah. Judy, I'm going to tell you something, okay? I am okay. I'm I don't come back in the studio. You, I keep kicking you out, but you can hear her, right? <laughs> okay. Charlene, we're going to get there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And I just early, Jody. <laughs> right? <laughs> Go ahead, Judy. You're here. Okay. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, your turn. Known as Northern Quebec. I have two spirit names Center Sky Woman and Beautiful Eagle Feather. These names were given to me by our traditional people. And my languages are Cree, English, and French. Uh, when I arrived in Mushhole at Mohawk Institute, I was registered as Marguerite Cooper. I changed my name to Judy. Uh, uh, once I left the residential school in uh, Bradford uh, at the Mohawk Institute, I changed my name to Judy because of sexual abuse. It was a name, uh, Marguerite, I hated. I thought I would be for, forever forget that name along with all the mishaps at residential school. I struggled throughout the years to forget what happened at residential school through alcohol and drug abuse. A couple of attempts with suicide, but I knew I had a gift. So I knew I had to, I, I do believe I wanted to stay alive. I, I'm a mother of one daughter. I have two grandchildren. Uh, Many nieces, nephews, and many relatives. I I'm walking the red road right now, but I like to share my story anywhere I go or any place I go, any place I'm invited. I like to share my story. After leaving residential school, I've learned that coming out of there, I wanted to continue learning. Today, I'm so proud of our people. Many of them still speak our language, even though many of us were not allowed to speak our language. Going home, we lived out in the land, like we lived in the bush. That was the best time. It was the best place to heal. Uh, the land became our dictionary. We continued with our traditional values, like hunting, fishing, trapping, a lot of family gatherings. And uh, in the summer when I used to go home, uh, it was a, a, a very joyful time. Family time, cousins, relatives, friends. We all spoke in Cree when we were on the land. That's why we say the land is our dictionary. Many people, my people, have had several residential school gatherings. This has allowed them to slowly open up. Many of them shared their stories, many tears were shed, and they brought them closer to their healing journey. Uh, when I was at residential school, I had two sisters, but they got transferred to another residential school, which is in Latouk, Quebec. I guess that was the only way they could separate us. And, um, yeah, with the number, uh, my, my number was 34. Forever 34 when I was at residential school. I didn't really understand the lineups, but uh, I just followed everybody just to stay out of trouble. Lineup time, I had to go line up with everybody. Uh, the thing I, I didn't like was, of course, mush every morning. Mush. Every morning we had mush. Sometimes we found worms in those in my bowl, but uh, other than that, I when I got out of there, I knew I wanted to do more for myself. Continue learning, go to school in Ottawa. But I did uh, remain close to 
most of my residential school survivors. Sometimes we gather together and just talk about what happened. We laugh and talk, and many times we would say we should have, we could have, you know. But uh, everything we talk about is done in Crete. It's just what makes me so proud of my people. They've maintained their language. Uh, I'm blessed with that. And uh, today, I'm just walking on my healing journey, continue learning and sharing what I'm doing much more. I'm happy. I'm sober. I think I've been sober for 30 years. And I was so glad to go back to Brantford. I saw my buddy Charlene there. Almost made me cry just to see her. When I went back to Mushroom, the uh, building looked small. That's when I walked in. It was huge. A huge building. It was a long bus ride. We had to take yeah. the bus, but uh, the first time I ever took the bus, I was just told you're going to go for a long ride. My parents dressed us, gave us our best outfits, bought us clothes. I don't remember. I think it was a day and a half we were on the bus. People were excited and everything. I mean, uh, uh, the kids, I think some of them, it was the first time they ever been on the bus. I think I was only six or so when I went on the bus. It was exciting, but uh, my, my, my mom told me, you are going to go for a long ride. So I kind of enjoyed the scenery and everything, but little did I know I was going to go ahead to much hole. One year I didn't go home. If I had TB, I had to stay in Brantford for the summer. That was the worst time. I had to stay in, uh, in Hamilton for the summer. It was nice. We stayed with the elders. They made us feel really home, the elders. It was a nice feeling. But to be told two days before you're supposed to go home, that was a nightmare. I remember that Miss Smith held her hand, made us watch the bus go, squeezed our hands before if we ever started to bring tears. She squeezed our hand really hard. She didn't want us to cry. I remember the bus, the gray, ugly bus. <laughs> no toilet in the bus either. I remember going and I left behind me and my sister. The sad part about it is my mom only found out that we went on the bus. Was told by the Indian agent Two daughters will be coming home this summer. That's what hurt the most. I could just imagine my mom, my dad, being told, your two daughters are not coming home. Other than that, I'm happy today. I have so much to share, but I could talk for hours about how my parents felt when they took us away. They told my dad, you're not going to get a paycheck if you don't let your kids go to school. And my mother, too, she was working as a... a, a Helpers, uh, helping in the kitchen, kitchen anyway, so some sawmill. That they told my mother they won't get their paychecks if they don't get, if they don't let their kids go to school. So they had to let us go. That's what hurt me. I can just imagine how I felt 
how my parents felt. Let us go. They don't even, they didn't even know what Bradford was. That's what concerned me the most. And I talked to my mother about it today. She remembers. But today she just laughs at it. She just tells me, you're home. You talk Cree and French. That's it. Thank you for listening to me. Did you hang up? <laughs> no. <laughs> wow, Judy. Yeah. I said, wow. I, said, yeah. I think that's that's the thing about um uh, about listening to other stories and everything like that and helping trying to get an understanding of um the way yeah. the way it was there because there was changes right yeah and i wonder yeah i think when you um judy was there and had the mush all the time that was before my time because <laughs> i i didn't have much all the time back in 1966 we got i remember we had cold cereal you know like cheerios and that Oh yeah. And once in a while we had, oh. once in a while we had bacon and eggs too, right? Oh, that, that was, was the great. later years. That's what I know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it was it was. Pardon? I ran away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the highlight at my residential school to run away. Oh. <laughs> my day is missing. I didn't know where it was going. I was just happy. <laughs> oh, yeah. How can we plan that one out, eh? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yes. I was just excited because I was out of there and we had to crawl through cornfields. <laughs> <laughs> we were going down dead end, dead end streets. <laughs> I was still happy. No, <laughs> but we gathered. Remember, we um we saved fruit and everything from our 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 lunches and our meals. We saved yeah. fruit. Remember, <laughs> we stashed our fruit and then we had that <laughs> that extra set of clothes. That we had an extra set of clothes that. When we left through the cornfield <laughs> that <laughs> night, <laughs> well, we went down to the river there and we changed, we changed our clothes, eh? And I was just wondering when we when I drive by there and I thought, I wonder who found our clothes and everything because we have numbers inside. <laughs> <laughs> and we were at, and we were on our way to walk. Pardon? I did not care when I got caught and punished. I didn't give a damn. I was so happy. Yeah. The great escape. That was a great escape, but <laughs> Yeah. And I remember like um, I was so hungry and everything, but I didn't I I was I wasn't going home. Um when we ran away with uh, Margaret um no, Fuzzy? Yvonne, I mean. Yvonne. <laughs> She's going to take us to Buffalo, and I never had no idea where Buffalo was. <laughs> I had no idea, but I was happy. <laughs> oh, pouring rain down the res, right? We went to Fuzzy's, um, Yvonne's, uh, mom's mom's place and she wouldn't let us she didn't want us to stay there when they were drinking down at this other place <laughs> oh my goodness that what i when we got to caledonia because we were on our way to buffalo had no idea where it was and then um we got to caledonia <laughs> we got to caledonia i knew that i knew that there was um i know the Brit the, the river was in Bradford. went to Bradford. the grand river went to Bradford. so when I left you in Caledonia, 
I walked all the way back to Brantford and I was so sunburnt and everything when I got back there and I was hungry. So I think we already had cereal that Sunday morning, right? <laughs> and I left juice and then I just went walking because I said, I'll follow this river because it's going to take me all the way to Brantford. <laughs> But almost up to Bradford there, it cuts off and it goes way back there. I go, oh my God, I'm losing my main road. So I went up to this couple's place, the, the older couple. I went up to their place and um, I asked them, I said, can you give me a ride to Bradford? And, uh, the, and I told them where I was. Um, I don't think they knew where it was, what it was, but I just told 184 Mohawk Street. So they took me there and they let me off at the end of the driveway. And um, I went walking up the long laneway and went inside, just um, sunburnt and everything. And and um, Miss Hill asked me where I was and <laughs> where you were. And I said, I don't know. They're going to Buffalo. <laughs> and then, uh, I never got the strap. <laughs> I never got the strap, though. I just, I never got the strap. And uh, the only time, what the, my um, thing was, uh, I got one. Um, Remember, we, we could go to Stan's Variety on Saturdays to buy buy stuff if we had money. If we had money in the office, that uh, we could go to Stan's Variety, which is still there in Brantford. And um, we could go there on Saturdays, like, and uh, go spend for candy and that. But I remember I couldn't go anyway, so but I didn't care. I never got a strap, but she got me some snacks, like cookies and milk and that. And then... Um, I was told to go have a bath and and, and go to bed. <laughs> so, um, I was a, I was an inter <laughs> I was an intermediate then. <laughs> but yeah, I just like when I go by there, I just think of you because here is room come back and here you are with us. And <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So tell me, did you guys have a story about a brick or something, Judy? What's that? What was that story about? Oh, the brick. It was a uh, um a brick. I write my name every time I I was sexually abused. And I want, I, I, I didn't know where to go. I, I, I figured I'd write it down. Writing it on a piece of paper didn't matter to me because it was going to be scrapped. So I figured I'd write it on a wall. So I could see it. Whereas if I wrote it on paper, I'd scrap it. So I wrote, please help me. But I wrote my name more often because I went back to the same brick. I wrote my name, Marguerite. Every time it happened to me, I went back. I wrote my, I went back to the same brick. I wrote Marguerite, went over, over and over. That's mm -hmm. why my name is so visible in Brantford. But I remember I, uh, uh, I wrote, please help me, because I didn't know where to go. Uh, I didn't understand what I was going through. Um, I was lost. I, I, I couldn't understand it. Always made me wonder if anybody went through the same thing I did. So that's why I wrote it on the brick. Please help me. I was hoping somebody would see it, but then again, nobody knew who wrote it, except me. Mm -hmm. And I wrote my name over and over again in Brantford, too. Every time I was sexually abused, I went back to the same brick, wrote, pressed on my same signature or letters in Brantford. That's why my name is so visible. visible. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. No problem. I thank you for listening to me. <laughs> hey, Judy, I can see myself hanging out with you. 
<laughs> you guys had me for like an hour this morning, killing myself. My husband's like awfully close to your your camera. <laughs> I was like, anyway, the guys in your office must think well, you're crazy too. Mm. Oh yeah. Yes, it's amazing. <laughs> you ladies are amazing. You really are. And <laughs> Shirley, she helped me when I went back to Brantford. It meant a lot to me. And I told my mother the story when we headed it out. Yep. I'd love to. I'd love to get you guys on a on a on a movie in a show, or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You guys are too oh, much. Just, You're funny. Just, just try to connect. With, just try to connect with each other, and it's just like it's connect to each other. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God! Well, la well, laughter's laughter's medicine, right? So you gotta have yeah. you gotta have laughter. For, because oh, yeah. you know we don't we don't live you know we don't live back there anymore right we don't leave live back there so that's why that's why I can share my story my stories you know much better now um, yeah because it's I got to look back to at the yeah yeah it's easier easier to talk about it now and laugh at it yeah <laughs> especially the running away part. <laughs> Oh, the highlight of my <laughs> resident. Oh. So, so maybe what we, maybe what we could do to finish up here, if if you still have a little bit of time, Judy. Uh, yeah. I know I put a picture of you. Um, I love the one of you on your poster. I put the one of you holding up your eagle feather, because. Oh, yes. But I love the one that you sent me that day to say, oh, this is me right now. And it looked like you cut somebody out of that picture. But anyway, this morning you FaceTimed with Char Charlene. Yeah. Do you think mm -hmm. if we hang up with you, you can FaceTime her and then everybody can see your cute face? Oh, no problem. Okay, cool. Awesome. <laughs> and let's do that. FaceTime, buddy. Okay, so FaceTime your buddy and we'll see you in a minute. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I had to um, burn some medicine when uh, Judy was the one that said that she was the one that wrote, uh, please help me on the brick. Yeah. And I just got chills because when I saw that brick for the very first time, I just stood there and looked at that brick and wondered yep. what her story was. And now know what the story was and it is i'm i'm just i'm speechless and come, <laughs> but to come forward and talk about that is there's judy <laughs> judy she still can't find the camera okay <laughs> there she <laughs> Wonder, oh, oh there she is. Come on. <laughs> people are lovely. You're oh, awesome. Thank you so much. When you yeah. when you come back this way, we're gonna we're gonna nab you for a day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Judy, I was Judy, I was saying that um before you before you got on is that we've been to uh, Woodland Culture Center with our teachers and professional development and stuff. And I've, I went outside and I was just, you know, having a moment to myself. And then I saw that brick that said, please help me. And I wondered, like, I wondered, you know, who wrote that and what the story was. And, you know, and today you've, you shared that with us. And I just want to say thank you. I'm very honored to know that, uh, you know, to meet the person that had put that on the brick. Um, and it just, uh, you know, yeah. the, your story, your story is very, you know, yours and Charlene's relationship is so important. So I'm just going to, I'm going to go in the backstage here and that you, let you two continue your conversation as well. But thank you so much for being, for being here and, and being 
truthful. Like I said to Mike earlier, we're we're truth tellers when we're when when we're eagle feather carriers, and not only that, we're indigenous. Just being indigenous truth teller. So I want to thank you so much for speaking your truth. So Charlene and Judy, you can continue on your oh. on your little conversation if you'd like. <laughs> Yeah, you're awesome. You're awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My lifetime. Yes. <laughs> I love you. Yeah. You, you help me on you. Me, help me on my journey and too. Go down there. Yeah. Just to go down. I know yeah. you're gonna come. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And you bring that mama with you. Go to the hamburger joint. The burger barn. Burger barn. Yeah. I've never forgot that place. My plate was so big. Oh, that was fun. Yeah. Anyway, I love you. Take care. I love you too. And you take care and hugs to your mom. <laughs> yeah, I will. I was talking to her last night yeah. about you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bye, Judy. yeah. <laughs> we'll oh. be in touch, Judy. Yeah. We'll be in touch, she said. Yes, of okay. Okay. Yeah, you too. Love you. Bye. <laughs> oh. She's. Oh, so this is what happened this morning. We just could, she couldn't figure out which one to turn off, which one to turn on. It was actually fun. There was maybe one minute, no, maybe not even one minute. Really, about five seconds where I was like, "Okay, I'm done." <laughs> and but then Charlene brought me right back in the room. She's like, "Oh yeah, no, this is okay. This is her. This is her." And I I love that. It's like every every other word or second she can say i'm happy i'm happy yeah yeah you know and this is the beauty of of um the people that have shown up in the last few weeks for what we're creating here and i can't say it enough that you know this is something that when we were just talking with the grandmas like what what do we do right now to change this you know what do we do right now to make a difference and connect with people that need that need other people that need someone that need to remember that this is this pandemic is just for now, you know, and uh, yeah. the inspiration and the strength that has come from our guests and our sister. Like, I'm just really moved in Charlene. Like, mm -hmm. you're awesome. I feel like I've known you forever. And the, the I guess the connection is that I my grandmother was from that area. You know, mm -hmm. my cousins there, the connecting that I've been doing myself there. But it's these mm -hmm. stories have really helped me fill in the gaps of what I didn't know mm -hmm. about yeah. my family. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense. And the stories resonate, you know, of why my, mm -hmm. my family wasn't so present in what, you know, what could have been yeah. their life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't know my grandmother was in there. My mom's mom was in there until, when, when like when Ida was saying, like they took us to Toronto, right? I was. It was the start of the reconciliation things, um, gatherings of that. I went to went to Toronto there, and I found my grandma's name in a book there, the Anglican Church book in Toronto. There, I found my grandmother's name in there, but I I did find her name in that green book too, <clears throat> because. My grandma and and my mom and them, they never talked about it. Because when my grandma was there in 1917, she it says in there in the in the book there, it says she was taken there, dropped off there by her mom and dad. And the second year she was there, she was abandoned by her mom. So my mom didn't know that. So when I told my mom that, she goes, Oh, that's why she didn't talk about her mom. You know, her her mom didn't talk about so. Um, so my, my mom, my, my mom wasn't raised on six stations. She was raised in Jordan station. So, and everything 
that happened to that went with my grandma when she only went to grade six and, and she worked half a day and went to school half a day when my mom was in grade six and she was 12 years old she had to quit school and then she had to go work in the orchards in jordan station so 12 years old she's going to be um 88 this year you know and but at 12 years old she was making 25 cents an hour she said and, you know and she had to she worked for she worked for Jordan, um, the winery, you know, the distilled, in a big field of grapes that she had to go in there and cut grapes and that. But that's who she worked for. She was getting 25 cents an hour. She said she was, as a 12 year old, she was getting paid an adult's wages, she said, because she was such a good worker. But, but she did go to school up to grade. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, I take my mom back to Jordan Station and I listen to her stories, right? When I listen to her stories, I get an understanding of why she raised us the way she did. Yeah. Especially after my mom, my mom and dad split up and um, I was five years old. Well, I went from Longhouse to the under, under the reserve here to Sunday school, you know, and then to go to residential school. I had to, I had to go to church. I had to go to Mohawk Chapel, the Anglican. So now I'm, I have my mom, she has her name, uh, my daughter, youngest daughter and her, her two children, they have their names. I have a, a niece with um, two, two great nieces and they all have their names, you know, so, and we go back to Longhouse, but I, I haven't been gone. I didn't go back last year and I'm okay with it. And I didn't go this year so far because I'm, I'm compromised and I don't want to, you know, do that to myself, but, but <clears throat> So I have 38 years of sobriety of uh, drinking because that was in my home. The alcoholism was in my home along with domestic violence. And I didn't want to repeat those. I didn't want to repeat those cycles. So I stopped them. I started to, and then I stopped them, you know, because I had three kids and, um, and that was it. Three kids. And I had, there had one dad and he was white. And when I married him in 1980, I lost my status. So I thought I, it was very violent, you know, like we, it was the good, the bad and ugly in that relationship for 20 years. And we met in grade nine <clears throat> after I got out of residential school because um, with my own kind of people, I thought everybody, every guy was like that. But yeah, I picked the same kind of guy. I picked the same kind of guy as the ones that were beating up my mom and everything, you know. <laughs> And we were in that relationship for 20 years and I finally got divorced and I've been back on a reserve back to Six Nations now for oh, 20 years in June. And and um, I have my own house. Like I have my own house now for almost 12 years. I got 16 acres here and um, I'm back into the medicines, like I, the natural medicines, you know, because <clears throat> those natural medicines were here long before the pharmacies, right? So that's why I... Um, I'm going back to the medicines here when um, we that's what we use because um, I didn't want to become dependent on pills and everything because I was already codependent in my relationship with my husband right I depended on him to help me with the kids and you know <clears throat> I stayed home for the first five years while he worked and um, yeah and I never had that opportunity, so but I was going to make the change. I was going to stop those cycles that I grew up in. And like I said, I've been sober for like and I, my sobriety is uh, 38 years and I don't smoke and I don't drink pop and everything like that. So my well-being, I'm 65 years old and I, I, I want to live in peace and love. And I just want to, you know, like um, live life now, you know. Why well, I have been living life, and like I said, I've been all through the years, I've been thriving. I said, <clears throat> because like wherever my spirit needed understanding, um, somebody was put in my path. You know, could it be language, could it be culture, could it be tradition? Just for understanding, when I needed that, my spirit needed understanding, and that's how I got back. And I go, wow, you know, because they, you know, people come into your life for a reason, you know, just to could be a little while a week or something right and and i remember when like i'm so proud that judy and them that they can speak their language to Cree, like and it's all they all speak it plus french too but i remember at the residential school when they were there 
in order for them not to speak their language Cree, because when they came in, they were trilingual, right? Um, they were trilingual, so they had a French teacher there. And for the little ones, the young ones had to go in there. My my sister had to go in there too because there was no. She was only five, and I remember that that French teacher there, like so that they wouldn't speak Cree. She spoke French and English to them, you know. So that was part of it. You know, a lot of people don't really realize it. That was because I didn't know either till you know I heard I read that thing on John Mc John McDonald John A McDonald and Duncan Campbell Scott. When I read that, you know, I was so angry, so angry, you know, because I did see those experiences when I in my life when I was growing up. How you know, like even me when I got married, you know, 1980, they took away they took away my my um, membership, they took it away, you know. <clears throat> I, I'm back again, back in 86 or something, we got that, um, um, Bill C-31, you know, me and my, me and my three kids have, we uh, got our membership back, and, and I just like, you know, like, um, wow, but you know what, I can't let them, I can't have no resentments toward my relationship to the residential school, towards my relationship, or the government, because that's going to hurt me inside, you know, it's going to hurt me. It's, it's toxic, the toxic energy and everything. You have those thoughts in there. Um, I just can't know. I, I've forgiven myself. I've forgiven my mom. And um, and I have to do that because it hurts me. It doesn't hurt anybody else. Like that government doesn't hurt them because they're still not changing, right? We still don't go. You know, I work in a, a, a treatment center there. And our, our treatment center burned down two years ago. And... And, there, and the government's stalling on giving us money because you know why? Because that treatment centers to help our people, right? To get a hold of our trauma. They don't want people going back in their trauma and getting healthy. Stay, um, stay um, addicted, you know, into something. That's what it is. But we're going, we're moving, you know, we're moving with it. So I'm just, just proud of our people. And, and And it's not the drugs and alcohol that we treat. It's a trauma inside. Everybody has trauma. Nobody is perfect. Everybody has trauma. Even when you lose a pet, a pet dies or something. That's trauma. And if you just and if you just repress it down, repress your feelings and don't validate your own self or your feel validate your feelings. That's how we become that onion, you know. Then after when you're in your healing journey, then you gotta start peeling off those layers like a like a um like an onion, you know, and get to the core issue. So yeah, I believe you know within me, I have I have my an my ancestors within me on my mom's side, my dad's side, you know, because my on my dad's side they're um they're traditional, they go to longhouse and everything. So, but yeah, so I had that I had that part in my first you know my first five years of life before it got <laughs> it got it got into the other life, <laughs> the Western life, I guess. <laughs> But you know, I had my that my name. Hey, what I have in me? She carries flowers. So I had that name first. You know, that was my first name. So when my mom registered me, she had to register me as an English name. She had to give me an English name. So that's how I got Charlene. Yeah. So Charlene, um, yeah, I, I just look at that. So I had to, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it's um, it's I just love life now, you know, and I love listening to the other survivors because I learned from them. We there's different eras. We were at different eras, you know. When I say I had bacon and eggs, sometimes some of them don't like it because all they had was mush. <laughs> like Judy was there long before me, and I was there in 1966, grade um, grade five. Um, I went back in grade seven because I didn't like my home life at home, you know. Uh, but my first hit, the time my first time I ever got hit was when I was 10. And that was in, that was in a residential school. And um, I was on top bunk and my sister was on bottom bunk. But you could hear little girls crying all over, you know, like that's sad because they were so little. And um, so I, like, I was missing my mom. My, my I had a new baby sister and I was missing him. So Miss um, Hill, she was just young. 
she's still alive in Simcoe, but she, I, you know, she said, put your hand up if you didn't have a good day today. So I put my hand up and then she seen it after. So after everybody was in bed and said the prayers and everything, she said, okay, everybody that had their hand up into the bathroom. We went to the bathroom and I wondered, I thought she was going to listen to me. What was going to ask me? What, what, what was wrong with today? You know, <clears throat> but she did. She said, stand there and put your hands out. So I had to stand there like this and put my hands out there in front of me. We're all in a row. And then she comes with a big ruler, big, you know, big, uh, one of those two inch rulers and just up and down, up and down, you know, on my hands. And I thought, what the heck? I'm getting hit for being sad today, you know. <laughs> and that's when I learned to push my feelings down. And I wasn't going to tell anybody about my feelings because of what happened to me. And I think it was only about four years ago. Um, I could stand there with my hands out with no fear of getting hit. I had to heal these hands that took the brunt of that ruler, right? And I didn't cry because I just didn't understand why I was getting hit. And so. That was the first of my the first of my hits, and then because I didn't have my voice, um, like Ida said that like we really didn't talk before, and but but um, because I didn't have my voice, I always pushed I pushed all my feelings down, you know, pushed them down, and uh, because I never had really anybody to talk to, not even my mom. My mom was too passive, right? And I was pissed off at her for you know getting having this guy there and uh, beating, he's beating her up and everything. And, and um, we got taken away. Right. But I've, I've learned after understanding, I've learned, I forgave myself for having those dark feelings and angry feelings. And I forgive her too. You know, she's gone through a lot herself, you know, out of eight of us, four of her kids are gone, you know, and um, yeah, she's lost them. She's had so many losses herself, but she's still, she's still um, cooking us supper, and you know, I just love her for all the hard work that she went through and she's 80 going to be, she's 87 and she still babysits her um, grandson. Uh, my sister does 12 hour shifts. She's a PSW. So yeah, I work in um, addictions and, uh, but I had to go, I work in um, daycare first. I had to go her up, heal my little girl inside, you know, I had to heal my little girl inside and let her have all those safe boundaries and everything that I never had, you know, so I had to grow my little girl up by going into working in daycare and everything like that. And then after I went and worked in the shelter and I had to get because doors are locked all the time. That's how the residential school was. So my triggers, I was getting triggered by all these things. But as the triggers came, I am. Um, I had to I had to deal with them. I didn't have to push them down anymore, you know, because I learned ways. I have a lot of modalities that I learned that, you know, I don't have to push things down anymore. And and where I work, um, where I work, uh, we have to do our own work. I just love it there because we have to do our own work. Um, and um, because you can only help somebody as far as you've gone. And if you don't heal your own stuff, you can't get this stuff out of a book. You can't get my experience out of a book because I didn't write one, right? <laughs> so I think the understanding, you got to hear the truth and then uh, have the understanding before reconciliation can come. That's the truth. You know, you got to have that truth. And it happened. You know, it, it happened. It's not, you know, and I'm glad that physical site is still there. I'm glad it's there, but it's not my... I don't, I don't fear it now when I go up there, when I go up that long laneway, because I dealt with my fears. So that was my, oh, I hate it going back there, you know, especially on a Sunday night when I come home on the weekend, you know, I hate it going back there. And then, um, and to this day, you know, separation is really, it's, it's, um, separation has got us all apart. We're not close, you know. I have a, my sister that was in there. She's still numbing. She's numbing her feelings with drugs and alcohol. My brother's doing the same thing. My other brother passed away. That was in a residential school. Um, yeah. And the ones that were taken away, um, they're like, they passed on too. So it's, 
cancer my and my grandmother my mom was only 19 when she lost her mom to cancer and then she's got a she only got one sister left and she or oh, another brother that wasn't raised with them but um yeah and we're not close we're not close at all like not like a close-knit family should be right we're not like I could sit, I live here alone and I could sit here at home there and I, and I am okay. I'm okay with it because I think it's because I don't have, I won't, don't want to have to deal with anybody else, you know, but I have that, I have that, you know, like when there's drinking and something like that, I don't have to be there anymore. I'm not that little girl that had to stay in it. Right. And I don't have to be there anymore. So yeah, I've come a long way and I'm proud of myself. You know, I'm very proud of me of what I got and I didn't I, I did like you know I was already divorced when I got my house and everything like that I had to think of these plans myself how am I going to build a house how, you know like what am I going to do and so I just got a prefab <laughs> it was the best thing to do <laughs> I got to pick everything out they came and delivered it you know and I'm in it <laughs> so, but yeah I just love you know I had to uh, really think of all the things that came into my path and everything for me and um no we're not all on the same level you know we're not and i have to accept that just because you got this you're only going to take out of it what you need for you right and that's what that's why I said, whatever this hour thing i was in a you know i'm on zoom every day for work and everything and um i only take it out of what i need for me you know, with, because I know somebody, if somebody comes across my path and needs my support and encouragement, then I can do that for them, right? I be, because everybody's journey is their own journey. So, yeah. Um, but, you know, the intergenerational stuff is, you know, I was intergenerational first before I became a survivor, you know. And I had to survive there. And then now I'm a thriver. <laughs> so, like I said, I come a long way. And I back to my language, you know. My ceremonies, I've come that way now, you know, so I just, I have to get more fluid. My daughter, my youngest daughter, she's a registered dietitian, and she's also in her second year of the language program, Kegel language program. That's how I'm going to earn her a um, diploma in that, in the language. So I'm glad that she takes it, you know, and I speak the basic commands to um, my grandchildren. Like I'll say, Sagato, you know, I mean, that means you look. And my little grandson, he's going to be two this month, but he understands. He understands that. So, yeah, I'm just I'm just so happy in my life here. And I'm glad Jody got a hold of us. And I, especially to connect. Uh, because I, there's things I didn't know about Judy before, you know. And, um, and and I'm glad that she could she shared that. Because I did go to the community before. Um, and I did a support them. I was a support there. And I heard a lot, you know. I even had to conduct a sexual abuse session up there that time. And I had no idea what I was doing. But it, it worked out because it was all laden in cedar. And it was the cedar top and everything. And and I had this one book of letting go. And, and it was people the people spoke Cree and everything. Even though I didn't understand it, it wasn't for me to understand. It was for them to release what they had in the, about sexual abuse. It was their story, not mine, you know. So. I didn't, I didn't understand Cree, but, you know, they knew what they were talking about. They were speaking their truth, right? And that's all it is, is speaking your truth. And that's another thing with the understanding for people is listen, you know, listen, be a heart with ears. And to listen and to, um, you know, um, yeah, be that heart with ears and listen, because that's how I got through my journey, my all my my deaths, you know, I had to be the strong one because I didn't take drugs or anything like that. And my mom was on nerve pills and, you know, everything like that when I lost my brothers and um, sister. And um, I lost a brother right after me, you know, and then a brother be above me with cancer and one was alcoholism. So I, you know, I couldn't grieve because I didn't know how to grieve. I was used to having all that stuff, stuff down, eh? pushed down and then I had to be the strong one, you know, so because people were drinking and people were taking prescription pills and that, but I wasn't taking nothing. And I, I just didn't, you know, 
I never really had no support. But I, you know, my doctor, I went to him and I think I just wanted him to listen to me. <laughs> but he sent me to a nun. <laughs> so, you know, every Friday I was sitting there with that nun, <laughs> with that nun there, that sister there. And she just listened to me, you know, she didn't stop me or anything. She didn't. And that's what I, how I released a lot of stuff. You, because you voice it, you feel it, you voice it and you, and um, you empower yourself. That's how you get empowerment. You get your empowerment back. So that's why I said, now I have no resentments for that residential school. I have no resent resentments for my marriage, like 20 years. I'll never live like that again. And I have no resentments to the government because why why carry those resentments within you when it when it's toxic and it affects your health, right? Because they're not going to change anyway unless we get our own people up there. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it's just like it down in the U.S., you know. But yeah, um, did you anything? Want to ask me or anything? <laughs> Any questions? No, you're no? awesome. No, you're awesome. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna just. Well, when we talk, I, we just have to be careful because we get a lot of feedback on your end. But um, no, Charlene, you're awesome. Did I say that already? You know, it's funny, Sherry. Yeah. Like, what? Remember I told you yesterday. I hope my friend is watching. One that that I that told me that I talk a lot. Like he didn't just say it one time. He said it like four times. Like you talk a lot. Like you need to stop talking. And I'm like, this is perfect because I'm gonna say I'm working through my stuff. I am. I'm emerging. Yes. I'm healing. I'm all that. Right. So right. Thank you. You just gave me my uh, permission. <laughs> so there. Yes. This is, you're <laughs> awesome. You know what I. You know what I love about all this and what we're doing. I love the imperfection yeah. that takes us to the perfection, yeah. which is this. And yes. that there is, you know, we are living yeah. in a world that is just like everything has to be so perfect. You know, I've left five yeah. times from this show to go feed my daughter who's still saying it's not ready yet. Like, you know, <laughs> we're in this, we're living this. Yeah. So important yes. to show people that it's not about perfection, it's about connection, right? It's about just make that connection and yep. touch. And uh, there's so much that I'm learning from our guests. And you're awesome, Charlene. And there's a lot of stuff that we're going to do with Grandmother's Voice and our, yeah. you know, the, your group, right? Um, you know, we're yeah. still here. We've already been talking about, like, the possibilities of bringing everybody together and at least having that platform to be able to come and, and know that you are you know you're all you can connect with anybody at any time and so i know how challenging that can be because i just tried to connect all 30 of you this week or all of our <laughs> guests for the next and and yeah. that I've gotta tell you that was that's been a little bit of a yeah. challenge but i think it's helped me break yeah. through some, some stuff so um thank yeah. you sherry did you want to ask ask yeah. uh something while i go get macy's lunch <laughs> 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 Just, you know, your honesty, right? And and being very vulnerable. And it's really brought me to a certain space as well. Um, and and just, you know, knowing that we're all healing and we all do it in a different way. Um, understand, you know, what our parents, especially if they were residential school survivors and what, you know, the, the, the coping mechanisms that they had. I know that I would be drinking and drugs if my kids were taken away. Um, and, uh, mm -hmm. and no recourse. I had no idea that um, that was something I learned today. I had no idea that pay, like your your actual job payment would, would have been withheld if you didn't send your kids to residential school. Um, out in the prairies, yeah. the, the um, my mom, my granny, it was the it was the RCMP that came to the came to my granny's house and took them away. And, um, and it was forcibly taken, like she had no choice but to give them, otherwise she would go to jail. And so with the RCMP, yeah. have, you know, I know that they've given an apology, but they still haven't, they haven't done any reparations when it comes to Indigenous folk yep. in Northern communities, mm -hmm. anywhere that they have done anything, they've done more damage than good. They've killed our people and they still continue yeah. to kill our people. Um, and mm -hmm. so with, with the strength and the tenacity and the resilience that 
we're learning from our residential school survivors. And not only that, like the thrivers, I, I really, really, I really like that, you know, because not only did you survive, you're thriving. And, you know, I look at, I look at myself as well and I'm 60. And so I look at myself as well, knowing that, you know, we survived too, you know, we survived the resident like, intergenerational trauma, but also the 60 scoop and, and being taken away mm -hmm. from, you know, our family and our mother, but then, you know, finally all of us getting together and having, a, and we did have a fairly close relationship with all of my siblings. Um, and I think it was because my mm -hmm. mom, you know, we didn't want to disappoint her. And I think my mom really made sure that we all got along and, uh, you know, and so mm -hmm. To this day, there's still, there's nine of us. My brother had passed away a couple of years ago, but still nine of us are still, you know, they all live in, out, out West. So I'm the mm -hmm. only one that's here, but I love every single mm -hmm. one of my siblings. Um, it wouldn't, wouldn't have been the same and, and, and being brought up the way that we did. Um, but also mm -hmm. being generation two, right? Like you talked about that being yeah. the first generation of not having, um, of not putting up with a dysfunction, of not having that that vicious cycle of alcohol abuse and drug addiction and domestic disputes. Um, you know, I know yeah. too, I am also the first generation that nobody's going to come to my house and take my kids away from me. Nobody's going to knock on mm -hmm. my, my kids away. And so that really makes me feel very solid and, and strengthened and really firm in my beliefs and, and where I plant my feet on a daily basis because I know how hard all of our survivors and thrivers had to had to had to fight for for where we are and even just the, to the point of suppressing our emotions and having to relive those uh, emotions so that we can get better and healthier people ourselves so I just want to thank you so much Charlene for for being and and really being truthful because an awful lot of our listeners never heard any of these uh, statements mm -hmm. before, and um, and some of them might have heard some of it. But when we are when we're in the presence of residential school thrivers, um, you tell the truth and you tell exactly how it was and how you were able to come come through this uh, this hard part of life. And you know, and it's and we just mm -hmm. are so thrilled, you know, like to be part of grandmother's voice to know that we have those elders and knowledge holders that hold us up and also hold us mm -hmm. and have ceremonies that are feeling down and brush us off and push us back out there again to do the work right yeah. so you know that's all that's all part of what we missed when we were growing up as well as not having our mm -hmm. grandpas and our uncles and aunts and around us to help us uh, to to stand shoulder to shoulder and and to create that awesome community that we know we all came from so I'm holding up my hands yeah. to, um, <laughs> you know because it is just a uh, amazing amazing energy that you've uh, you've created and that you know that people are feeling so so open and honest in this virtual forum and I I just really want to thank you so much mm -hmm. it's only day two oh. We have three I more days. <laughs> and then another couple of weeks of our That's speaker awesome. series. Yeah. So looking, oh, yeah. Forward to, looking forward to the rest of the week because we get to meet some more um, of the, the members, right? Of We Are Still Here, that organization that we're really yeah. going to, to support. Grandmother's Voice from the beginning is like, why, why are we not doing this? Why are we not doing something more, you know? And I think just going back, Sherry, to the inspiration you and I were watching um, about, you know, what can we do with this speaker, this series that we put together? And then we watched that, um, you know, it's been five years. I can't remember what it was tiled about, you know, with the, the residential school kind of follow up. And and we were both on the phone mm -hmm. with each other saying, oh, my gosh, this needs to, we need to do something about this. Right. We need to have more conversations. Mm -hmm. We need to tap in. And then it was like, boom, boom, boom. Ida, 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 yeah. all of you, this is wonderful. So, so, so yeah. grateful okay. that you're just around the corner from us. And, you know, yeah. all the work that you do, Charlene, is just awesome. We're going to stay in touch. Mm -hmm. We're going to, we're going to build some great relationships, have some fun, get you guys your bus to travel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to talk to those guys on Friday. They're like, yeah, let's get a bus. <laughs> We're gonna travel all over. Like, yeah, let's do it. I'm myself driving the bus. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, we're gonna we're gonna edit a lot of these videos out anyway. <laughs> a lot yeah. of these. Um, oh, so boy. 
Yes, thank you so, so much. We'll we'll uh, be in touch thank and you. we'll see you soon and mm -hmm. uh, and watch the rest of the week. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And we'll yeah. onigiha and and yawa goa. Yes, yawa goa. <laughs> uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's